Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out tonight, too, of our wonderful performance. Um, the students have worked really hard on this play, so we hope that you enjoy it. So without further ado, I present to you, and then there were none. First lot to be arriving in Jim's boat, another lot not far behind. Good evening, Fred. Good evening, Miss Rogers. Is that the boat? Yes. Oh, dear, already. Have you remembered everything? I think so. Lemons, slip soles, cream, eggs, tomatoes, and butter. That's all, isn't it? That's right. So much to do. I don't even know where to start. No may till tomorrow, and all these guests arriving today. Oh, calm down, Ethel. Everything's ship shape now. Looks nice, don't it, Fred? Looks neat enough to me. Kind of, uh... Bear, but rich folks like places bear, it seems. Rich folk is queer. He was a queer sort of gentleman who's built this place. Spent a wicked lot of money on it, he did, and then gets tired of the place and puts it all up for sale. Beats me why you always wanted to buy it, living on an island. Oh, come off it, Ethel, and take all that stuff into the kitchen. They'll be here any minute now. Making that steam climb an excuse for a drink, I suppose, like some others I know. That be young Jim. I'll be getting along now. There's two guests arriving by car, I understand. I want at least five loaves in the morning and eight bins of milk, remember? Right. Don't forget the oil for the engine, Fred. I have to charge it up tonight or have the lights running down. So let's hold up on railway. It's at the station now. I'll bring it across first thing tomorrow. And give a hand with the luggage, will you? Right. I forgot to give you the list of guests, Tom. Thanks, old girl. Hmm, doesn't look like a very classy lot. Miss Claythorne, she'll probably be the secretary. I know how much with the secretary is, worse than hospital nurses, giving themselves airs and grace, looking down at the servants. Oh, stop grousing about it, Ethel, and cut along to that lovely up-to-date kitchen of yours. Do me a new fun get gasket for my fancy. So this is it. How perfectly lovely. Miss Claythorne. You're Rogers? Yes, good evening, miss. Good evening, Rogers. Could you bring up my luggage and Captain Lombard? Very well, miss. So you've been here before? No, but I've heard a lot about the place. Oh, from Mr. and Mrs. Owen. No, old Johnny Brewer, a pal of mine, built this place. It's a sad and poignant story. A love story? Yes, ma'am, the saddest of all. He fell in love with the fam famous Lily Logan. Bought the island and built this place for her. Sounds most romantic. Poor Johnny. He thought by cutting her off from the rest of the world, not even a telephone on his means of communication, he could hold her. But the fair Lily tired of her ivory tower and escaped? Uh-huh. Johnny went back to Wall Street, made a few more millions, and the place was sold. And here we are. Well, I ought to go find Mrs. Owen. The others will be up in a minute. It would be very rude of you to leave me here all by myself. Would it? Well, I wonder where she is. She'll come along when she's ready. While we're waiting, you mind if I have a drink? I'm quite dry. Of course you could. It's warm after that steep climb up here. What's yours? None for me. Not on duty. A good secretary is never off duty. Really? This is exciting. What? All this, the smell of the sea, the gulls, and this lovely house, I'm going to enjoy myself. I think you are. I think we both are. Here's to you. You're quite lovely. Where's Mrs. Owen? Mrs. Owen is down in London, I'm afraid. It won't be down until tomorrow. Tomorrow, but... Here's the list of guests expected, Miss, if you would like to have it. Thank you. I say, how awful. You'll be sweet and help me, won't you? I won't move from your side. Thank you. It seems odd to have brought only us in the first boatload and all the rest in the second. That, I'm afraid, was by design, not accident. <laughs> design? What do you mean? I suggested to the boatman that there's no need to wait for any more passengers. That and five shillings soon started the engine. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. Well, they're not a very exciting lot, are they? I thought the young man was rather nice looking. Callow. Definitely callow and quite, quite young. I bet you think a man in his thirties is more attractive? I don't think, my darling. I know. Where's the place you've got here? I'm Mrs. Owen's secretary. Mrs. Owen has been detained in London, I'm afraid, and won't be down until tomorrow. Oh, too bad. May I introduce Captain Lombard, Mr. Martha. Anthony Martha. Have a drink? Oh, thank you. What do you have, gin, whiskey, sherry? What do you have, eh? 
Wonderful place you have here. I'm Mrs. Owen's secretary. Mrs. Owen has been detained in London, I'm afraid, and won't be down until tomorrow. Say when. Oh, wizard. How are you? My name's Lombard. Have a drink, Mr. Davis. Davis is the name. Mr. Davis, Mr. Marston. Mr. Marston, pleased to meet you. Thanks, Mr. Lombard. I don't mind if I do. Bit of a stiff climb up here, but whoo! What a view, and what a height. Reminds me of my days in South Africa, this place. Does it? What part? Oh, that's all. Durban, you know. Well, here's the temperance. Do you know South Africa? Me? No. <coughs> Excuse me. That's where I come from. That's my natal state. Ha <laughs> ha! Interesting country, I should think. Finest country in the world, sir. Gold, silver, diamonds, oranges. Anything a man could dream of. Talk about a land flowing with beer and Skittles. <laughs> Uh, how do you do? General Mackenzie, is it? I'm Mrs. Owen's secretary. Mrs. Owen has been detained in London, I'm afraid, and won't be down until tomorrow. May I introduce Captain Lombard, Mr. Marston, and Mr. Davis. Davis is the name. Whiskey and soda, sir. Uh, thanks. You in the service? Formerly in the King's African Rifles. Too time for me in peacetime. I chucked it. Okay. One. Where is Miss Owen? I'm Mrs. Owen's secretary. Mrs. Owen has been detained in London, I'm afraid, and won't, won't be, be down, down until tomorrow. tomorrow. Indeed, extraordinary. Did she miss the train? I expect so. Won't you have something? May I introduce Captain Lombard, Mr. Marston, General Mackenzie, and Mr. Davis. Davis is the name. May I take your case? Do let me get you a drink, a dry martini, a glass of sherry, whiskey, and soda. I never touch alcohol. You never touch alcohol. I suppose you know, young man, you left us there standing on the wharf. I'm afraid, Miss Brent, I was to blame for that. You see, I wanted to. It seems to me most extraordinary that Miss Owen should not be here to receive her guests. Perhaps she's just the kind of person who can't help missing trains? That's what I reckon she is. Not at all. Miss Owen is in the least like that. Perhaps it was her husband's fault. She hasn't got a husband. <sighs> I should like to go to my room. Of course, I'll take you there. Mrs. Rogers is upstairs, miss. She will show you. I'm afraid our host and hostess haven't arrived, sir. My name's Lombard. How do you do? Mine's Wargrave. How do you do? Have a drink? Uh, yes, please. A whiskey. How are you? Davis. Davis is the name. Wonderful place you've got here, I say. Quite unique. Yeah, as you say, quite unique. Your drink, sir? Old Badger Berkeley rolled up yet? Who do you say? Old Badger Berkeley. He wrote for him for his gig. When's he coming? I don't think he is coming. Nobody the name of Berkeley. Dirty old double crosser. He's let me down. Well, it's a wizard island. Rather a wizard girl. That's secretary. She ought to line things up a bit. I say, old man. What about dressing for dinner if there's time? Let's go explore. How is it? Things are a bit at sixes and sevens, but the Owen's not turning up. Tricky. I say a wizard place for a holiday. Aren't you going to sit down? Well, to tell you the truth, you seem to be in my chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were part of the family. Well, it's not that quite exactly. To tell you the truth, I live up at the Benton Club. I have for the last ten years, probably. My seat is just about there. Can't get used to sitting anywhere else, you know. It becomes a bit of a habit. Yes, it certainly does. Thank you. Well, it's not quite as good as the clubs, but it's a nice chair. To be honest with you, I was a little surprised when I received this invitation. Haven't had anything of the kind for well over four years. Pretty nice of them, I thought. Can I take your thing, sir? This Lady Constance Calmington expected here. Can you tell me? Lady Constance Calmington? I don't think so, unless she's coming down with the Owens. Oh. May I take your thing, sir? No, thanks. I'll unpack for myself. Dinner's at 8 o'clock, sir. Shall I show you to your room? Yes, please. Here you are, miss. I'll call Rogers. How are you? Davis. Davis is the name. Mine's Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong, I believe? Yes. 
Thought so. Never forget a face. Don't tell me I've forgotten one of my patients. Oh, no, nothing like that. But I did see you once giving expert court evidence. Oh, really? Are you interested in the law? Well, you see, I'm from South Africa. Naturally, the legal processes in this country are bound to interest the colonial. Oh, yes. Have a drink? No, thanks. I never touch alcohol. Mind if I do? Mine's almost empty. Not a bit. I say, I've been having a look around the island. It's a wonderful place, isn't it? Wonderful. I thought as I was coming across the mainland what a haven of peace this was. Too peaceful for some, I dare say. Wonderfully restful, wonderful for the nerves. I'm a nerve specialist, you know? Yes, I did know that. Did you come down by train? No, I motored down, dropped in on a patient on the way. Great improvement, wonderful response. Best part of 200 miles, isn't it? How long did it take you? I didn't hurry, I never hurry. It's bad for the nerves. Some mannerless young fellow nearly drove me into a dish near Amesbury. If I'd have had his number, I'd have reported him. Yes, and if only we had the numbers of these young roadhogs. Yes, you must excuse me. I'm going to have a word with Mr. Owen. Oh, but Mr. Owen will be in today. You rang, sir? Yes. Take my hat, will you? What time's supper? Supper's in a quarter of an hour, sir. I think tonight dressing will be optional. Got a place here? Yes, thank you, sir. Been how long? Just under a week, sir. Oh, so I don't suppose you know much about the crowd that's here? No, sir. All old friends of the family? I really couldn't say, sir. Uh, oh, well. Oh, Rogers. Yes, sir? Do you think you could put some sandwiches in a bottle of beer in my room tonight? I get quite the appetite with this sea air. I'll see what I can do, sir. I'll see that you won't lose by it. Take me to my room? Of course, sir. Great. You can do the wash and a brush up straight away. Dirty glasses. You are always leaving the dirty part for me. Here I am with the four glasses in my hands and no one to help me. You might give me a hand with the dressing up. Who you were talking to, by the way? Davis, South African gentleman. No class if you ask me, and no money either. I don't like him. I don't like any of them. Much more like that bunch we had at the boarding house, I would say. Davis gives out that he's a millionaire or something. You should see his underwear, as cheap as they make them. <laughs> well, as I say, it's not raining us right. All these visitors arriving today, and no maid till tomorrow. Who do they think we are? Now then, the money's good. So it ought to be. It gets me going to service again, unless the money was good. Well, it is. So what are you going on about? Well, I can tell you this, Rogers. I'm not any place where I'm put up on. Cooking is my business. I'm a good cook. First rate, old girl. But the kitchen is my place, and housework, none of my business. I have a good mind to put my hat and coat on, walk out now, go straight back to plummet. You can't do that now, old girl. Who says I can? I should like to know. You're on an island, old girl. Had you forgotten that? Yes, and I don't know if I fancy being on an island. Don't know that I do either, come to think of it. No slipping out to the pub or going down for the pictures. Oh well, if you double wages on your couch for the difficulties, and there's plenty of alcohol in the house. That's you ever think about alcohol? No, now stop your nagging and cut along to that lovely up-to-date kitchen of yours or your dinner will be spoiled. It will be spoiled anyway, I expect. Everybody's gonna be late. Wasted on them anyway. Thank God I didn't make souffle. You don't want to be a minute, miss. Just a guest and a dissing up. Are you all right, Rogers? Can you manage between the two of you? Yes, thank you, miss. The missus talks a lot, but she gets it done. What a lovely evening. Yes, indeed. The weather seems very settled. How plainly one can hear the sea. A pleasant sound. Hardly a breath of wind and deliciously warm. Not like England at all. I should have thought you might feel a little uncomfortable in that dress. Oh, no. It's rather tight, isn't it? Oh, I don't think so. You'll excuse me, my dear, but you're a young girl and you've got a living to earn. Yes? 
A well-bred woman doesn't like her secretary to appear flashy. It looks, you know, as though you're trying to attract the attention of the opposite sex. And would you say I do attract them? That's besides the point. A girl who deliberately sets out to get the attention of men won't be likely to keep her job long. Uh, surely that depends on who she's working for. Really, Miss Claythorne? Aren't you being a little unkind? <sighs> Young people nowadays behave in the most disgusting fashion. Disgusting? Yes. Low back evening dresses, lying half naked on beaches, all the so-called sunbathing, an excuse for mom's conduct, nothing more. Familiarity, Christian names, drinking cocktails. And look at the young men nowadays, decadent. Look at that young Marston, what good is he? And that Captain Lombard. What do you object to in Captain Lombard? I should say he's led a very varied and interesting life. The man's an adventurer. This younger generation is no good, no good at all. You don't like youth, I see. What do you mean? I was just remarking that you don't like young people. And is there any reason why I should pray? Oh, no, but it seems to me that you must miss an awful lot. You're very impertinent. It's just what I think. The world will never improve until we stomp out in modesty. White pathological. What did you say? Nothing. What about the old boy? He looks rather like a tortoise, don't you think so? All judges look like tortoises. They have that venomous way of darting their heads in and out. Mr. Justice Wargrave is no exception. I hadn't realized he was a judge. Oh, yes. He's been responsible for sending more innocent men to their deaths than anyone in England. Hello, you. Do you two know each other? Mr. Ar Armstrong, Miss Marston. What? Armstrong and I have just decided that the old boy. Yes, I heard you, and so did he, I think. Oh, Sir Lawrence. Miss Brent, isn't it? Yes, there's one, something I wanted to ask you. Will you come out here? A remarkably fine night. Absolutely wizard car. Super sports charge for Lady Colada. You don't see many of them on the road. I can get over 100 out of her. Did you come down from London? Yes, 280 miles, and I did in a bit over four hours. Too many cars on the road, though, to keep it up. Touch 90 going over Salisbury Plain. Not too bad, eh? I think you passed me on the road. Oh, yes? You nearly drove me into a ditch. Did I? Sorry. If I'd have seen your number, I'd have reported you. But you were footling along the middle of the road. Footling? Me? Footling? Wow, 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 wow. What? What about a drink? Good idea. Will you have one, Miss Claypon? No, thank you. Good evening, Mrs. Owen. Why, Mrs. Owen? You'd make the most attractive wife for any wealthy businessman. Do you always flirt so outrageously? Always. Oh, well, now we know. Tell me, what's this Brent talking to the judge about? I saw her trying to buttonhole him upstairs. I don't know. She seems so definite that there wasn't a Mr. Owen. You don't think that she isn't, that he's not, that they aren't. What, married, you mean? It's a shame we don't know each other. Could have given you a ride down. That would have been grand. I'd like to show you what I could do across Salisbury Plain. Tell you what, maybe we could drive back together. But I... Well, it seems darn silly. I've got an empty car. Yes, but she likes the way she's going back and... Oh, aren't they sweet, those ten little China soldiers? And look, there's the old nursery rhyme. What are you talking about? What soldiers? What nursery rhyme? Ten little soldier boys went out to dine. One choked his little self, and then there were nine. Nine little soldier boys sat up very late. One overslept himself, and then there were eight. Eight little soldier boys traveling in Devon. One got left behind, and then there were seven. Ladies and gentlemen, silence, please. You are charged with these indictments that you need respectfully and at the first time to commit the fall. Dr. Edmund Armstrong, that you did cause the death of the Lisa Mary Fleet. William Henry Moore, that you brought about the death of James Stephen Lennon. Emily and Caroline Brent, that you were responsible for the death of Beatrice Taylor. Vera Elizabeth Claythorne, that you killed Peter Bartleby Hamilton. Philip Mottler, that you were guilty of the deaths of 21 men, members of an East African tribe. John Gordon Mackenzie, that you sent your wife's lover, Arthur Ritchie, to his death. Anthony James Marston, that you were guilty of the murder of John and Lucy Combs, Thomas Rogers and Bethel Rogers, 
that you might not be back to the dead for me. Nor has John warned me that you are guilty of the murder of Benjamin Sackett. The prisoners at the bar have you anything to say in your defense? She'll be around in a minute. Get some brandy. Rogers, get some brandy. Who was that speaking? It sounded... What's going on here? What kind of a practical joke was that? Where did that voice come from? Here we are. Turn it off! Turn it off! It's horrible! A disgraceful and heartless practical joke. So you think it's a joke, do you? What else could it be? At the moment, I'm not prepared to give an opinion. Who the devil turned it on, though? And set it going. We must inquire into that. Oh, dear me. Oh, dear me. Allow me, sir. Allow me, madam, if I speak to her. Ethel, Ethel, it's all right. Pull yourself together. You'll be all right now, Mrs. Rogers. Just a nasty turn. Did I faint, doctor? Yes. It was the voice, the awful voice, like a touchment. Where's the brandy? Drink this, Mrs. Rogers. I'm okay now. I just give me a turn. Of course it did. It gave me a turn too. Wicked lies it was. I'd like to know. Who was it that put that record on the gramophone? Was it you, Rogers? I was just obeying orders, sir. Whose orders? Mr. Owens? Let me get this quite clear. Mr. Owens' orders were what exactly? I was to put a record on the gramophone, sir. I was to start with that one. I thought it was just to give you guys some music. A very remarkable story. <laughs> it's the truth, sir. Before heaven, it's the truth. I didn't know what it was, not for a moment. It had some title on it. Is there a title? A title? Yes, sir, it's entitled Swan Song. This whole thing is preposterous. Slinging accusations about like this. Something has to be done about it. This fella Owen, whoever he is. That's just it. Who is he? That is exactly what we must go into very carefully. Rogers, I suggest you get your wife to bed, then come back here. Yes, sir. I'll give you a hand. Will she be all right, Doctor? Yes, quite all right. I don't know about you, sir, but I feel I can use another drink. I agree. I'll fetch them. Preposterous, that's what it is. Preposterous. Whiskey for you, so long? I should like a glass of water, please. I'll get it. I'll have a little whiskey, too. She'll be all right now. I've given her a sedative. Now, Doctor, you don't want to drink after all this. No, thanks. I never touch it. Oh, so you said you'll have this one, General? Now then, Rogers, we must get to the bottom of this. Tell us what you know about Mr. Owen. You see, I couldn't really say, sir. I've never seen him. What do you mean, you've never seen him? My wife and I have just been here under a week, sir. We were engaged through a letter through the registry office, through Regina and Plymouth. That's a high-class firm. We can check on that. Have you got the letter? The letter engaging us? Yes, sir. Go on with your story. We arrived here on the 4th, like the letter said. Everything was in order, plenty of food and stock. Just needed some dusting and that. What next? Nothing, that is. We got orders to prepare rooms for a house party. 8th, then the next day, by morning post, we, re we received another letter saying that the Owens might be detained. And if so, we was to do the best we could. It also gave the orders about putting on the gramophone record and the dinner party. Here it is, sir. Headed Ritz Hotel and typewritten. <coughs> Coronation machine, number five, and signed paper, quite new. No defects. We might not get much out of this. We could check it for fingerprints, but it's been handled far too much. Quite the little detective. Got some fancy Christian names, hasn't he? Yulick, Norman, Owen. Quite a mouthful. I'm obliged to you, Mr. Marston. You have drawn my attention to a curious and suggestive point. I think the time has come for all of us to pool our information. It would be well for everybody to come forward with all information they have regarding our unknown host. We are all his guests. It would be profitable if each of us were to explain exactly how that came about. There's something very peculiar about all of this. I received a letter with a signature that is not very easy to read. The 
reported me from a woman whom I met at a summer resort two or three years ago. I took the name to be Ogden. I'm quite certain I've never met or become friendly with anyone named Bowen. Have you got the letter, Miss Brent? Yes, I will fetch it for you. Miss Claythorne. I never actually met Mrs. Owen. I wanted a holiday post, so I applied to a secretarial agency, Mrs. Grenfell's in London. I was offered this post and accepted. You were never interviewed by a prospective employer? No. This is the letter. Soldier Island, Sticklehaven, Devon. I've received your name from Miss Grenfell's agency. I understand she knows you personally. I shall be glad to pay you the salary you ask and shall expect you to take up your duties on August 8th. The train is the 1210 from Paddington and you will be met at Oak Bridge Station. I enclose five pounds for expenses. Yours truly, Una Nancy Owen. Mr. Marston. Don't actually know the Owen. Got a wire from a pal of mine, Frederick Berkeley. Surprised me a bit because I thought the old horse had gone Norway. I haven't got the wire. Thank you. Dr. Armstrong. In the circumstances, I think that my visit was nothing but professional. Mr. Owen wrote me that he was worried about his wife's health, her nurse be precise. He wanted a report without her being alarmed. He therefore suggested that my visit should be regarded as any ordinary guest. You had no previous acquaintances with the family? No. But you had no hesitation in obeying the summons. A colleague of mine was mentioned and a very handsome fee is suggested. I was due for a holiday anyway. Dear Miss Brent, I do hope you remember me. We were together at Bellhaven Guest House in August some years ago, and we seemed to have so much in common. I am starting a guest house of my own on an island off the coast of Devon. I think there is really an opening for a place where there is good plain English cooking and a nice old-fashioned type of person. None of this nudity and gramophones half the night. I shall be very glad if you could see your way to spending your summer holiday on Soldier Island, as my guest, of course. I suggest August 8th. 1240 from Paddington to Oak Ridge. Yours sincerely, U.N. Owen. Yes, the signature is slightly ambiguous. I uh, like the nudity touch. Here is my own decoy letter from an old friend of mine, Lady Constance Calmington. She writes to me in her usual vague, incoherent way, urges me to join her here, and refers to her host and hostess in the vaguest of terms. <coughs> Look here, I just thought of something. In a minute. But I... We will take one thing at a time, if you don't mind, Captain Lombard. General Mackenzie? Well, I got a letter from this fella Owen. Thought I must have met him sometime up at the club. Said some old cronies of mine were to be down here. Hope that excused the informal invitation. No, I haven't kept the letter, I'm afraid. And you, Captain Lombard? Same sort of thing. Invitationing, mentioning mutual friends. Haven't kept the letter either. Just now, we had a somewhat disturbing experience. An apparently disembodied voice spoke to each of us, uttering certain definite accusations. We will deal with those accusations presently, but at the moment, I'm interested in a minor point. Amongst the names we received was that of William Henry Bloor, but as far as we know, there's no one named Bloor amongst us. The name of Davis was not mentioned. What do you have to say about that, Mr. Davis? Cat's out of the bag, it seems. I guess I had better admit, my name isn't Davis. You are William Henry Bloor? That's right. I will add something to that. Not only are you here under a false name, Mr. Bloor, but I've noticed tonight that you're a first class liar. You claim to be from Natal, South Africa, but I know South Africa and Natal very well, and I'm prepared to swear you've never been there in your life. You, sir, have got me wrong. I'm an ex CID man. Ooh, a copper. I've got my credentials and I can prove it. I run a detective agency in Plymouth. I was put on this job. By whom? Why, Mr. Owen, of course. Sent a very nice money order along with a list of your names and said I was to keep an eye on you all. Any reason given? Said Miss Owen had some valuable jewels. Miss Owen, my foot, I don't believe such a person exists. Your conclusions are, I think, justified. Ulick Norman Owen. Una Nancy Owen. Each time, that is to say, you and Owen. Or by a slight stretch of fancy, unknown. But it's fantastic. Mad. Yes, I've no doubt in my own mind we've been invited here by a madman. Probably a dangerous homicidal lunatic. Oh my god. Whoever it is who has enticed us here, that person has taken the trouble to find out a great deal about us. 
a very great deal. And out of his knowledge concerning us, he has made certain definite accusations. Don't know what the are. Slender! I wish to say this. Our unknown friend accuses me of the murder of Edward Seton. I remember Seton perfectly well. He came before me for trial in June 1930. He was accused of the murder of an elderly woman. He was very ably defended and made a good impression on the witness box. But on the evidence, he was guilty. I summed up accordingly, and the jury brought in a verdict of guilty. In passing sentence of death, I fully concurred with this verdict. The appeal was lodged on the grounds of misdirection. The appeal was dismissed, and the man was duly executed. I wish to say before you all that my conscience is perfectly clear on the matter. I did my duty and nothing more. I passed sentence on a rightly convicted murderer. Did you know Seton at all? I mean, personally? I knew nothing of Seton previous to the trial. The old boy's lying. I swear he's lying. This fellow's a madman. Absolute madman. He's got a bee in his bonnet. He's got a hold of the wrong end of the stick all the way around. Well, I would like to say no truth, no truth in whatever he said about that young Arthur Richmond. Richmond was one of my officers. I sent him off on reconnaissance in 17. He was killed. I also like to say, resent it very much though, slur on my wife. Best woman in the world, absolutely Caesar's wife. You know, I've just been thinking. John and Lucy Combs must have been a couple of kids around over near Cambridge. Beastly bad luck. For them? Or for you? Well, I was more so thinking for me. But of course, sir, you're right. It was darn bad luck for them, too. But it wasn't my fault. They rushed out of some cottage or other. I had my license suspended for a year. It was a beastly nuisance. The speeding's all wrong. All wrong. Young men like you were a danger to the community. Well, I couldn't help it. It was just an accident. Might I say a word, sir? Go ahead, Rogers. There was a mention, sir, of me, my wife, and of Miss Jennifer Brady. And I would just like to say that there's not a word of truth in it. We were with Miss Brady when she died, and she was always in poor health from the time we came to her. There was a storm, sir, the night she died, and all the telephones were out of order, so I had to go to the doctor on foot, but he had gotten there too late. We done everything for her, sir. Devoted to her, we were. And there was never a word said against us. Never a word. Came into a nice little something at our death. I suppose, didn't you? Miss Jennifer Brady left us a legacy in recognition to our faithful service, and why not, I'd like to know. What about yourself, Mr. Bloor? What about me? Your name was on the list. Oh, I know. Lendor, you mean? I remember the name, though it didn't come before me. Lendor was convicted on your evidence. You were the police officer in charge of the case. I was, my lewd. He got penal servitude for life and died in Dartmoor a year later. He was a delicate man. He was a crook. It was he who put the night watchman out. The case was clear from the start. You were complimented, I think, on your able handling of the case. I got my promotion. I was only doing my duty. Convenient word, duty. What about yourself, Armstrong? The name meant nothing to me. What was it? Close? Cleese? I really don't remember having a patient of that name or it's being involved with death in any way. Of course, the whole thing's probably a long time ago. They come too late, so many of these people. Then, when the patient dies, it's always the surgeon's fault. Then it's better to give up surgery and take up nerve cases. Some, of course, give up drink. I protest. You've no right to insinuate such things. I never touch alcohol. My dear fellow, I never suggest you did. Anyways, Mr. Owen's the only one who has all the facts. Miss Claythorne? I was nursery governess to Peter Hamilton. We were in Cornwall for the summer. He was forbidden to swim out far. One day when my attention was distracted, he started off. I couldn't get to him in time. Was there an inquest? Yes, I was exonerated by the coroner. His mother didn't blame me either. Thank you. Emily Brent? I have nothing to say. Nothing? Nothing. You reserve your defenses? There's no question of defense. I have always acted according to the dictates of my conscience. What a 
one law-abiding lot we all seem to be, myself accepted. We're waiting for your story, Captain Lombard. I haven't got a story. What do you mean? Sorry to disappoint you all, it's just that it's perfectly true. I left those natives alone in the bush. Matter of self-preservation. You abandoned your men?! Not quite the act of a proper gentleman, I'm afraid, but after all, self-preservation's man's first duty. And the natives don't mind dying, you know. They don't feel about it as Europeans do. Our inquiry rests there. Now then, Rogers, who else is on this island besides ourselves, you and your wife? Nobody, sir. Nobody at all. You're sure of that? Quite sure, sir. Thank you. Don't go, Rogers. I'm not yet sure as to the purpose of our unknown host in getting us to assemble here, but in my opinion, he's not sane in the accepted sense of the word. He may be dangerous. In my opinion, it would be best if we left this place as soon as possible. I suggest we leave here tonight. I beg your pardon, sir, but there's no boat on the island. No boat at all? No, sir. Why don't you telephone to the mainland? There's no telephone either. Fred Narcott, he comes over here every morning and he brings the milk and the bread and the post and the papers and takes the orders. A bit of sporting. We have to ferret out the mystery before we go. Whole thing's like a detective story. Positively thrilling. At this time of my life, I have no desire for thrills. <clears throat> The legal life's narrowing. I'm off for crime. Here's to it. Choked and died. You can call it choking if you like. He died of asphyxiation. Never knew a man could die like that. Just of a choking fit. In the middle of life? We are on death. A man doesn't die of a mere choking fit, General Mackenzie. Marson said this is what we call a natural death. Was there something in the whiskey? Yes. By the smell of it, cyanide. Probably potassium cyanide. Acts pretty well instantaneously. Then he must have put it in the drink himself. Suicide, eh? That's a rum go. You'd never think he'd commit suicide. He was so alive, he was enjoying himself. Oh look, here's one of the soldier boys off the mantelpiece. Broken. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We're going to need a brief 10 minute intermission to clean up the messes. So, by all means, go get yourself some drinks and some beverages at the concession stand, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I hope you grabbed yourself some refreshments, because there's Act 3 of And There Were Nine. Still, that fellow brings their eggs and the milk and all that. Should have thought he'd get here before this. No sign of any breakfast, though. Where's that fellow, Rogers? Let's not bother with breakfast. How's the weather looking? Bit of a mackerel sky. Old boy in the train station yesterday. He said we were new for dirty weather. Shouldn't wonder if he wasn't right. I wish that boat would come. The sooner we get off this island, the better. It's absurd not keeping a boat on the island. No proper harbor. If the wind was to come blow from the south, a boat would get dashed to pieces against the rocks. But a boat would always be able to make us from the mainland. No, Miss Brent. That's just what it wouldn't. Do you mean we should be cut off from the land? Yes. Revita, condensed milk, and tin stuffed till the boat comes or the gale has blown itself out. But you needn't worry. This sea's only a bit choppy. I think the pleasures of living on an island are rather overrated. I wonder when the boat's coming, annoying the way the house is built slap up against the cliff. You can't see the mainland till you've climbed to the top. Shall we go up there again? It's no use, Doctor. 
A wash pot never boils. There was no sign of a boat putting out when we were just up there. What can this man Narcot be doing? They're all like that in Devon, never hurrying themselves. And where's Rogers? He ought to be about. If you ask me, Mr. Rogers was pretty badly shocked last night. I know. <coughs> Ghastly. The whole thing. Got the wind up properly. I'd say he and his wife did do that old lady in. You really think so? Well, I never saw a man more scared. Guilty, I should say. Fantastic. The whole thing. Fantastic. I say. Suppose he hopped in. Who? Rogers? But there isn't any way he could. There's no boat on the island. Yes, but I've been thinking. We've only Rogers' word for that. What if there is a boat on the island and he nipped off in the first thing? Oh, no. He wouldn't be allowed to do that. Sleep well, General? I dreamed. Yes, I dreamed. I don't wonder at that. I dreamed of Leslie, my wife, you know. Oh, uh, oh. Yes. Gee, I wish that fellow Narcot would finally show up. Who is Narcot? The bloke that brought us over yesterday. Was it only yesterday? Yes, I feel like that too. Batty gramophone records, suicides. It's all a man can stand. I shan't be sorry to see the back of Soldier Island. I give you my word. So you don't understand. How strange. What's that, General? I don't like the look of him. I reckon young Marston's suicide must have been a big shock to him. He looks years older. Where's that poor young fellow now? In the study. I put him there myself. Dr. Armstrong, I suppose it was suicide. What else could it be? I don't know, but suicide. You know, I had a pretty funny feeling in the night. This Mr. Unknown Owen. Suppose he is on the island. Rogers may know. Or he may have been told to say so. Pretty nasty thought, isn't it? But would it have been possible for someone to tamper with Marston's dream? Well, it was just standing there. Anybody could have slipped a dollop of cyanide in there if they wanted to. But that... There you are, ma'am. I've been all over the place looking for you. Could you come up and have a look at my wife? Is she feeling under the weather still? She's... She's... You won't leave the island without me. I wish that boat would come. I hate this place. Yes, I think the sooner we can get in touch with the police, the better. The police? The police must be notified in a case of suicide, you know, Miss Claythorne. Oh, yes, of course. What's going on here? No sign of any breakfast yet. Are you hungry, General? Feeling like breakfast? Leslie! Leslie, my dear! No, I'm not. I'm Vera Claythorne. Oh, I'm sorry. I mistook you for my wife. Oh? You see, I was waiting for her, you see? I thought your wife was dead long ago. I thought so, too. But I was wrong. She's here with us on the island. Good morning. Morning, Captain Lombard. Good morning. Boat here yet? No. Bit late, isn't it? Yes. Good morning. You and I could have had a swim before breakfast. Too bad all this. Too bad you overslept yourself. You must have good nerves to sleep like that. Nothing makes me lose my sleep. Didn't dream of African natives by any chance, did you? No, did you dream of convicts in Dartmoor? Look here, Captain Lombard. I don't think that's very funny. Well, you started it, you know. What about breakfast? I'm hungry. The entire domestic staff seems to have gone on strike. Well, we can always forge for ourselves. Hello, that's strange. What? Well, you remember we found one of these little fellows smashed last night. Yes, that ought to leave nine. That ought to leave nine. I swear there were ten of them when we arrived. Well? Well, there are only eight. So there are. I think it's queer, don't you? Probably yeah, there were only nine to begin with. We just assumed there were ten because of the rhyme. Hello, Armstrong. What's the matter? Mrs. Rogers is dead. No. How? Died in her sleep. Rogers thought she was still under the influence of the sleeping draught I gave her, and he came down without disturbing her. He lit the kitchen fire and did this room. Then, as she hadn't appeared, he went down and went looking for me. She's been dead about five hours, I should say. What was it? Heart? Impossible to say. It may have been. After all, she did have a pretty bad shock last night. Yes. She might have been poisoned, I suppose, Doctor. It's perfectly possible. With the same stuff as young Marston? No, not cyanide. It would have had to been some narcotic or hypnotic. One of the barbiturates, or chloral, something like that. You gave her some sleeping powders last night, didn't you? I gave her a mild dose of luminol. Didn't give her too much, did you? Certainly not. What do you mean? All right, all right, no offense. I'm just saying, perhaps if she had a weak heart, The or... amount I gave her could have not harmed anyone. Then what exactly did happen? Impossible to say without an autopsy. If, for instance, this death had occurred in the case of one of your private patients, 
What would have been your procedure? Without more exact knowledge of the woman's state of health, I could certainly not get a certificate. She was a nervous looking creature. She had a bad fright last night. Perhaps it was heart failure? Her heart certainly failed to beat, but what caused it to fail? Conscience. What exactly do you mean by that, Miss Brent? You all heard she was accused, together with her husband, of having deliberately murdered her former employer, an old lady. And you believe that's true, Miss Brent? Certainly. You saw her last night. She broke down completely and fainted. The shock of having her wickedness brought home to her was too much for her. She literally died of fear. It's a possible theory. One cannot adopt it without the woman's state of health. If there were a latent cardiac weakness... Call it, if you prefer, an act of God. Oh, no, Miss Brent. You regard it as impossible that a sinner should, be, should not be struck by, down by the wrath of God? I do not. My dear lady, in my experience of ill-doing, Providence leaves the work of conviction and chastisement to us mortals. The process is often fraught with difficulties. There are no shortcuts. Let's be realistic. What did that woman have to eat and drink before she went to bed? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing at all? Not a cup of tea or a glass of water? I'll bet you she had a cup of tea. That sort always does. Rogers assures me she had nothing whatsoever. You may say so. So that's your idea? Well, why not? What if it's true? What if they did do the old lady in? Miss Brent certainly thinks so. They're feeling quite safe and happy about it. Happy? Well, you see, they know that there's no immediate danger to them. Fen, last night, some lunatic goes and spills the beans. What happens? It's the woman cracks and goes to pieces. You didn't see him hanging around her when she was coming to. Not all husbandly solicitude, did you? Not on your sweet life. He was like a cat on hot bricks, and that's the position. They've done a murder and gotten away with it. But if the show's all going to be raked up now, it's the woman that'll give the show away. She hadn't gotten the nerve to brazen it out. Brazen it out. But him, he's all right. He'll go online till the cows come home, but he can't be sure of her. So what does he do? He drops a nice little dollop of something into her drink and gives it to her. And when he washes the cup in the saucer, he tells the doctor she ain't had nothing. Oh no, that's impossible. A man couldn't do that, not to his wife. You'd be surprised what some husbands would do, Miss Claythorne. Excuse me, miss, I'm getting on with breakfast, but it's lunch that's worrying me. I'm not much of a hand as I am a cook with cold tongue and gelatin to be satisfactory, and I can manage some tin fruit, cheese, and biscuits. That'll be fine, Rogers. Lunch? Lunch? We shan't be fair here for lunch. When the hell is that boat coming? Mr. Bloor! What? You'll pardon me, sir, but the boat won't be coming. What? Fred Narcott, he's always here before eight. Is there anything else you require to miss? No, thank you, Rogers. And it's not Rogers. His wife's lying dead upstairs, and he's down here calmly talking about breakfast, and now he says the boat won't be coming. How the hell does he know? Mr. Bloor! What? Oh, don't you see? He's dazed. He's just carrying on automatically as any good servant would. It's pathetic, really. He's pulling a fast one, if you ask me. The really significant thing is the failure of the boat to arrive. It means we are being deliberately cut off from help. That's very little time. Very little time. What's that, General? Very little time. Mustn't waste it talking about trivial things that don't matter. Why do you think Narakla hasn't turned up yet? I think the ambiquitous Mr. Owen has given orders. You mean told him it's a practical joke or something of the kind? He wouldn't fall for that, would he? Why not? Soldier Allen's got a reputation for people having crazy parties. This is just one more crazy idea, that's all. Narakot knows there's plenty of food and drink on the island. Probably thinks it's all just a big joke. Can't we do something? Light a bonfire at the top so they'd see us? It's probably been provided against. All signals are to be ignored. We're cut off, all right. Uh, can't we do something? Oh, yes, we can do something. We can find the funny gentleman who staged this little joke, Mr. Unknown Owen. I'll bet you anything you like, you like he's somewhere on this island. In my opinion, he's mad as a hatter and dangerous as a rattlesnake. Hardly a very good simile, Captain Lombard. The rattlesnake at least gives <laughs> warning of its approach. Warning? My god, yes, that's our warning. Ten little soldier boys. There were ten of us after Naraka went right there. Ten little soldier boys going up to dine. One choked his little self. Choked himself. Marston choked himself, didn't he? 
And then nine little soldier boys sat up very late. One overslept himself. That part fits Mrs. Rogers pretty well, wouldn't you agree? You don't mean that he wants to kill us all? Yes, I think he does. And each one fits with the rhyme? No, no, it's impossible. It's coincidence. It must be a coincidence. <clears throat> Only eight little soldier boys here. I suppose you think that's coincidence, too? What do you think, Floor? I don't like it. But there's nobody on the island. I'm not so sure about that. This is terrible. None of us will ever leave this island. Can't somebody shut up, Grandpa? <laughs> what do you think, Sir Lawrence? Well, I agree with you, up to a point. Well, then the sooner we get to searching, the better. Come on, Armstrong, come on. Laura will make short work of it. I'm ready. Nobody would happen to have a revolver on them by any chance. I'd suppose that's too much to hope for. I've got one. Always carry that with you? Usually. I've been in some tight places in my time. Well, you've probably never been in a tighter situation than you are today, this Mr. Unknown Owen. If he is on the sound, he's got an entire arsenal to him, and he will use it. You may be wrong there, Bloor. Many homicidal maniacs are very quiet, unassuming people. Delightful fellows. You'd never guess there was anything wrong with them. Well, if Mr. Owen turns out to be of that kind, we'll leave him to you, Doctor. Now, I suggest we go search. Lombard, you do the house, and me and Armstrong will do the island? Right, that's gotta be easy. No secret panels or sliding doors. Mine, he doesn't get you before you get him. Don't worry, I'll be all right. I've got a revolver. But you two better stay together. Remember, one got left behind. Let's go, Armstrong. <coughs> Very energetic young man, Captain Lombard. Well, don't you think he's right? If there is anyone on the island, they're bound to find him. It's practically bare rock. I think this problem requires brains to solve it rather than brawn. Where are you going? I'm going to send the sun and think, my dear young lady. Where did I put that skein of wool? Is it upstairs? Shall I go fetch it for you? No, I'll go. I'll know where it's likely to be. I'm glad Captain Lombard has got a revolver. They're all wasting time, wasting time. What do you mean? It's much better to sit quietly and wait. Wait for what? The end, of course. I wish I could find Leslie. Your wife? Yes, I wish you'd known her. She was so pretty, so gay. Was she? Yes, I was a lot older than she was, of course. She was only 26. Arthur Richmond was 27. He was my ADC. We used to talk of music and plays together. I thought she took a motherly interest in the boy. I was pleased. Damn fool was an I. No fool like an old fool. Exactly like a book the way I found out. When I was out in France, she wrote to both of us. Put the letters in the wrong envelope. So I knew. Oh no. It's all right, my dear. It was a long time ago. But you see, I loved her very much, and I trusted in her. I never say anything to the boy. I just let it all gather inside here. A slow, murderous rage. Young hypocrite. I like the boy. I trusted him. I wonder what the others are doing. I sent him to his death. Oh. Yes, it was quite easy. Mistakes were being made all the time. All anyone could say was that I had lost my blunder, made a sacrifice, one of my best men. Yes, it was quite easy. Leslie never knew. I never told her I'd found out. But somehow, nothing was quite real anymore. She died of pneumonia. She had a heart-shaped face and gray eyes and brown hair that curled. Oh, don't. Yes. I suppose in a way it was murder. Here he is, murder. And I've always been such a law-abiding man. <laughs> Serves him well, right? That's what I thought. Well, after. Well, you know, don't you? What do you mean? You don't seem to understand. I thought you would. I thought you too would be glad that the end was coming. I... We're all going to die, you know. I, I don't know. You haven't gotten to that point yet. The relief, the blessed relief, when you know that you don't have to carry the burden any longer. General. Don't talk to me that way. You don't understand. I just want to sit. Wait for Leslie to come for me. I'm frightened. Oh, I'm frightened. All correct. No secret passages. One corpse. Don't. I say, you do look low. How about a drink to stay your nerves? A drink? 
two corpses in the house at nine o'clock in the morning, and all you have to say is have a drink? An old man going, quite crackers. That's all right, just have a drink. Ten people accused of murder. That's fine, just have a drink. Everything's fine so long as you have a drink. All right, stay thirsty. You're nothing but a waster, an adventurer. You make me tired. I say, you are better. What's the matter, my sweet? I'm not your sweet. I'm sorry, I rather thought you were. Well, you can think again. Come now, you don't really feel that way. We have something in common, you and I. Rogues and murderers can't fall out. Rogues and murderers? Okay, you don't like the company of rogues and murderers, and you won't have a drink. I'll go finish searching. Unpleasant young man, I can't find it anywhere. Is anything the matter? I'm worried about the general. He really is ill, I think. Looking out for the boat, General? His sin has found him out. Oh, don't. One must face facts. Can any of us afford to throw stones? Even if his wife was no better than she should be? And she must have been a deprived woman. He had no right to take judgment into his own hands. What about Beatrice Taylor? Who? That was the name, wasn't it? You are referring to the absurd accusation about myself? Yes. Now that we're alone, I have no objection to telling you the facts of the case. Indeed, I should like you to hear them. It was not a fit subject to discuss before gentlemen, so naturally, I refused to say anything last night. That girl, Beatrice Taylor, was in my service. I was very much deceived in her. She had nice manners and was clean and willing. I was very pleased. But of course, all that was was sheer hypocrisy. She was a loose girl with no morals. Disgusting. It was some time before I found out that she was what you call in trouble. It was a great shock to me. Her parents were decent folks, too. I'm glad to say they didn't condone her behavior. What happened? Naturally, I refused to keep her an hour under my roof. No one shall ever say I condone immorality. How old was she? Seventeen. Only seventeen? Quite old enough to know how to behave. I told her what a low deprived thing she was, and that she was beyond the pale, and that no decent person would take her into their house. I told her that her child would be a child of sin, and would be branded all of its life, and that the man would naturally not dream of marrying her. I told her that I felt soiled by ever having her under my roof. Told a girl of seventeen all that? Yes, I'm glad to say I broke her down utterly. Poor little devil. I have no patience with this indulgence towards sin. And then I suppose you turned her out of your house? Of course. She didn't dare go home. What did it feel like when you found out she'd drown herself? Feel like? Ye yes, didn't you blame yourself? Certainly not. I had nothing to which reproach myself. I believe you really feel that way. That makes it even more horrible. That girl's unbalanced. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they make, and the net which their hid net is, is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hand. <coughs> Breakfast is ready. The wicked shall be turned into hell. Be quiet. Breakfast is ready, miss. Do you know where everybody is? To Lawrence Wargrave is out sitting in the sun. Dr. Armstrong and Mr. Blore are searching the island. I wouldn't bother with them. Shall not the isle shake at the sound of the fall, when the wounded cry, when the slaughter's made in the midst of thee? Shall we go in? I don't feel like eating. Breakfast is ready. Then all the princes of the sea shall come down from their thrones, lay away their robes, and put off their border garments. They shall clothe themselves with trembling. They shall sit upon the ground, and shall tremble at every moment, and be astonished at thee. Reading aloud, Miss Brett. It is my custom to read a portion of the Bible every day. Very good habit, I'm sure. What luck did you have? There's no cover on the island, no caves, no one could hide anywhere. That's right. <coughs> there's no one in the house either. I will stake my life, there's no one here but ourselves. I searched the whole place from attic to cellar. <laughs> Breakfast is getting cold. Breakfast? Come on, Gloria, you've been yelling for breakfast.
breakfast since you woke up. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Or who knows, perhaps even today. You ought to be ashamed of such levity, Captain Lombard. Breakfast? Come on, General, breakfast, I say, sir. Good God, there's a knife in Mackenzie's back. He, he's dead. But he can't be. Who could have done it? There's only us on the island. Exactly, my dear sir. Don't you realize that this clever and cunning criminal is always comfortably one stage ahead of us? How he seems to know exactly what we're going to do next and makes his plans accordingly. There's only one place on the island where a successful murderer could hide with a reasonable chance of getting away with it. One place? Where? Here, in this room. Mr. Owen is one of us. Well, Mr. Blore, I wanted to have a word with you. You were right what you said last night. That murderer is one of us, and I think I know who it is. Really? Ever hear of the Lizzie Borden case? Old couple in America, killed by their daughter in the middle of the morning. A respectable, middle-aged spinster. Incredible. So incredible, they acquitted her, but they never found any other explanation. Then your answer to the problem would be Miss Emily Brent? That woman is mad as a hatter, I tell you. Religious mad, and we must watch her. Really? I had formed the impression your suspicions were in a different quarter. Yes, but I've changed my mind, and I'll tell you why. She's not scared, and she's the only one that isn't. Why? Because she knows she's in no danger. Hush. I've made some coffee. Sure, it's cold in here. You'd hardly believe it was a lovely day this morning. Are uh, Captain Lombard and Roger still out? Yes. There's no boat on the island. It wouldn't put out anyway. Miss Prince? Allow me. I say, I'm glad on your insisting we go to lunch and having some brandy with it. I feel much better. The court always adjourns for lunch. All the same, it's a nightmare. It feels as though it can't be true. What are we going to do about it? We must hold an informal court of inquiry. We may at least be able to eliminate some innocent people. You haven't got a hunch of any kind, do you, Miss Claythorne? If Miss Claythorne suspects one of us three, that is rather an awkward question. Oh, I don't suspect any of you. If you ask me who I suspected, I'd say Dr. Armstrong. Armstrong? Yes, don't you see? She's had far and away the best chance of killing Mrs. Rogers. Terribly easy for her as a doctor to give an overdose of the sleeping stuff. Yes, but you also must remember, somebody else gave her brandy. Her husband had a good opportunity of administering a drug. It isn't Rogers. He wouldn't have the brains to fix this stunt, nor the money. Besides, you can tell he's scared stiff. My god, it is something like a storm out there. Oh, it's only you. Who did you think it was, Beatrice Taylor? Not huh? hope. Not hope of rescue until this dies down. Is that coffee? Good, I'm taking the coffee now, you see. Such restraint in the face of danger is nothing short of heroic. I do not, of course, profess to be a weather prophet. But I should say, it is highly unlikely a boat could reach us, even if they knew of our plight in under 24 hours. Even if the wind drops, the sea has still to die down. You're awfully wet. Was well, anybody a swimmer here? Would it be possible to swim to the mainland? The mainland's over a mile, and in this sea, you'd be dashed on the rocks and drown. Drown. Drown the pond. I beg your pardon, Miss Brett? After dinner nap. It's terribly cold in here. I could start a fire if you would like to That's a good idea. Very sound scheme, Rogers. Before I go, does anybody know what's become of the top bathroom curtain? Really, Rogers, have you gone bets too? The top bathroom curtain? Yes, it's scarlet oil silk. It's missing. Anybody seen a scarlet oil silk curtain? Sorry, Rogers, no good. 
It's all right. I only thought it was a bit odd. Everything on this island's odd. I'll just go get a few knobs of pull some sticks and get a lovely fire going. He's awfully wet. I'll just bring him some hot coffee. Rogers! Rogers! Let's become a Armstrong. He went up to his room to rest. I suppose somebody's battered him one by now. I expect he had the good sense to bolt his door. It won't be so easy now that we're all on our guard. I advise you, Mr. Bloor, not to be too confident. I should like shortly to propose certain measures of safety which I think we should all adopt. Against whom? Against each other. Of the ten people who came to this island, three are definitely cleared. Seven of us remain. Seven little soldier boys. One of whom is a bogus little soldier boy. Exactly. I do think that you, Sir Lawrence, and Dr. Armstrong are above suspicion. She's a well-known doctor, and you're known all over England. That proves nothing, Mr. Bloor. Judges have gone mad before now. So have doctors. So have policemen. Here, here. Well, does he want some coffee? No, he'd rather make himself a nice cup of tea. Well, I was thinking about Dr. Armstrong. Do you think we ought to bring her up a cup? I'll take it up if you like. I'll take it. I want to go change. Do. You'll catch a cold. I think Dr. Armstrong might prefer to see me. She might not admit you, Captain Lombard. She might be afraid of your revolver. Ah, yes, that revolver. I want a word with you about that. Do go and change. What were you going to say? I would like to know why you brought a revolver down on what's supposed to be a little social visit. You do, do you? Well, I've been in a bit of a jam once or twice. I've gotten into the habit of keeping a gun on me. It's a nice feeling to have a gun handy, wouldn't you agree? We don't carry them. Now, I want the truth about that gun. What a suspicious fellow you are, Bloor. I know a fishy story when I hear one. If it's about that revolver, I'd like to hear what you've got to say. Oh, well. I got a letter asking me to come down here as a guest of Mr. and Mrs. Owen. It'd be worth my while. The writer said that there'd be a bit of danger, but I'd be all right if I kept my eyes open. I never would have fallen for that. Well, I did. I was bored. God, how bored I was back in this tame country. It was an intriguing proposition, you must admit. Too vague for my liking. That was the little charm. It piqued my curiosity. Curiosity killed the cat. Yes, quite. Do go and change, please. I'm going, my sweet, I'm going. The maternal instinct, I think it's called. Don't be ridiculous. That's a tall story. If it's true, why didn't he tell it to us when he first got here, when we were telling us our stories? Perhaps he might have thought that this was the emergency for which he'd been prepared. Perhaps it is. Perhaps it was Mr. Owen's little bit of cheese to get him into the trap like the rest of us. He must have known him well enough to rely on his curiosity. He's a wrong in that man. I wouldn't trust him a yard. Are you such a good judge of truth? We must get out of here. We must. Before it's too late. The one thing we must not do is give way to our nerves. I'm sorry. Rather a case of physician. Heal thyself. I've been overworked lately and run down. Sleeping badly? Yes. I keep dreaming. Hospital? Operations? A knife at my throat? Real nightmares. Yes. You ever dream you're in court, sentencing a man to his death? Are you by any chance referring to a man called Edward Seton? Because I can assure you I should lose no sleep over the death of Seton. He was a particularly brutal and cold-blooded murderer. The jury liked him. They were inclined to let him off. I could see it. However, I cooked Seton's goose. Woo! It's cold in here, isn't it? Rogers is a long time. Where, where's that fellow at anyways? He said he'd gone to get some sticks. 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 Sticks! My god, sticks! Oh my god. How many are there? Are there only six? There are only five. Five? Rogers and Lombard? Oh no, not Philip! Where's Bloor off to like a madman? Oh, Philip, I... Have you seen Rogers? No, why should I? Two more soldiers have gone missing. Two? I thought it was you. Well, what was it? In the scullery. Is he? Oh, yes. He's dead all right. Somebody must have come up behind him while he was bent over the wood box with an axe. In the scullery. One chopped himself in half, and then there were six. <laughs> stop it, Vera, stop it! <laughs> She'll be all right. What's next, boys? Bees? Do they keep bees on the island? That's the next verse, isn't it? Six little soldier boys playing by the hive. A bumblebee stung one. A bumblebee? Well, we all look pretty spry. Unless you don't think. 
A hypodermic syringe. The modern bee sting. While she was sitting there, one of us. One of us? Which of us? And now, a 10 minute intermission. Please enjoy our concession stand when it opens in one second. Soldier boys sitting in a row, watching each other and waiting for the blow. New version up to date. I hardly think this is a moment for facetiousness. Have to relieve the gloom. Darn that electric plant running down. Let's play a nice round game. How about inventing one called Suspicions? A suspects B, B suspects C, and so on. Let's start with Bloor. It's not hard to guess who Bloor suspects. Sticks out a mile. I'm your fancy, aren't I, Bloor? I wouldn't say no to that. Quite wrong, you know. Abstract justice isn't my line. If I were to commit murder, there'd have to be something in it for me. All I'm saying is that you've acted very suspiciously from the start. You've brought a revolver down here, you've told two different stories, and now you say you've lost it. I have lost it. That's a likely story. What do you think I've done with it? I suggested myself that you should search me. Oh no, you're too clever for that. You don't have it on you, but you know where it is. You mean I've cashed it away somewhere waiting for next time? I shouldn't be surprised. Why don't you use your brains, Bloor? If I wanted to, I could have shot the lot of you by now. Pop. 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 Yes, but that's not the big idea. What, the crazy Dutch? My god, man, I'm sane enough. The doctor says there are some lunatics you'd never think were lunatics. That's true enough, I'd say. We shouldn't just be sitting here, doing nothing. Surely there's something we can do if we lit a bonfire? In this weather? It is, I'm afraid, a question of time and patience. The weather will clear. Then we can do something. Light a bonfire, heliograph, signal. A question of time? We don't have time. We shall all be dead. I think the precautions we have now adopted will be adequate. We shall all be dead, I tell you. All but one. He'll be thinking of something. He's thinking now. Poor Louise. What's her name, please? Was it nerves made you do her in, Doctor? No. Drink. My God, I was drunk whenever I operated. It was quite a simple operation, though. My hand shaking all over the place. I remember her now. A big, heavy, countrified woman. And I killed her. So I was right. That's how it was. Sister knew, of course, but she was loyal to the hospital or to me. I gave up drink, gave it up altogether. Then I went to a study of nervous cases. Very successfully. One or two lucky shots, or one or two important men. They talked to their friends. I've been so busy, I've hardly known which way to turn. I'd gotten to the top of the tree. Until Mr. Unknown Owen. Then down will come Cradle, doctor and all. Will you stop your sneering and joking? Please, please, we can't afford to quarrel. That's all right by me. I apologize. It's this terrible inactivity that gets on my nerves. We have now adopted, I feel convinced, the only measures of safety possible. So long as we remain together, each of us within sight of the other, a repetition of the tragedies that has occurred is, must be, impossible. We have all submitted to a search. Therefore, we know that no man is armed, neither with firearms nor a knife nor has any man got cyanide or any other drug about his person. If we remain, as I say, 
each within sight of each other, nothing can happen. But we can't go on like this. We shall need food, drink. That's what I say. Obviously, the murderer's only chance is to get one of us detached from the rest. So long as we prevent that, we are safe. Safe? You're awfully silent, Vera. There isn't anything to say. I wonder what the time is. This is awful waiting. Waiting for the hours to go by and yet feeling like they might be the last. When is the time? Half past eight. Is that all? Pretty awful light, this. How are the candles holding out? There's an entire packet in the other room. Storm's dying down a bit. What do you think, sir? Perhaps. We mustn't be too optimistic. The murderer's got everything on his side. Even the weather seems to be falling in with his plans. What about something to eat? I could go out and open some tin tongue and make some hot coffee, but you four stay here. That's right, isn't it? Not quite. You see, Miss Claythorne, it might be inadvisable for any of us to eat or drink something that you prepared out of our sight. You don't like me, do you? It's not a question of likes or dislikes. Nothing gets by you, Sir Lawrence. You aren't offended by my saying so. You're my fancy. Now is hardly the time, Captain Lombard, for any of us to indulge in the luxury of taking offense. I don't think it's Bloor. Could be wrong, but I can't feel Bloor's got the brains for this job. I will say, if you are a criminal, I take my hat off to you as a darn fine actor. Thank you for nothing. I don't think it's Armstrong. I don't think she's got the nerve. You've got plenty of nerve, Vera. On the other hand, you strike me as eminently sane. You'd only do murder if you had a thoroughly good reason. Thank you. I've thought of something. Splendid! Animal, vegetable, or mineral. That man says he's a police officer, but he's only said so after the gramophone record when his name was mentioned. Before that, he was a South African millionaire. Perhaps it's another one of his impersonations. What do we know about him? Nothing at all. He's a police officer, all right. Look at his feet. That's enough from you, Captain Lombard. By the way, Miss Claythorne suspects you, Doctor. Oh, yes, she does. Haven't you seen her shoot a dirty look at you from time to time? It all works out quite prettily. I suspect Sir Lawrence. Bloor suspects me. Armstrong suspects Bloor. What about you, Wargrave? Quite early in the day, I had formed a certain conclusion. It seemed to me as if everything that had happened pointed quite unmistakably towards one person. I'm still of that opinion. Which one? Well, no. I think it might be inadvisable to mention that person's name at the present time. Inadvisable in the public interest? Exactly. What about the food idea? No, no. Let's stay here. We're safe here. Can't say I'm hungry. I'm not particularly ravenous myself. You can go out and have a guzzle by yourself, Floor. Tell you what, suppose I go out, bring a fresh tin of biscuits. Good idea. Oh, and Floor? Yes? An unopened tin, Floor. Don't like the wind making the curtains rattle. I wonder what happened to the top bathroom curtain. The one Rogers missed. By the wildest stretch of imagination, I cannot possibly think what a homicidal lunatic would want with a scarlet oil silk curtain. Things have been disappearing. Miss Brent lost a skein of knitting wool. So this murderer, whoever he or she is, is a kleptomaniac too? How does it go? Five little soldier boys? Going in for law. One got in chancery. In chancery. But how could that apply? Unless, of course. Precisely, my dear young lady. That's why I'm sitting right here. Ah, uh, yes, but I'm casting you for the role of murderer, not victim. The term can apply to a boxer. Maybe we'll start a free fight. That seems to let you out, my dear. Oh, it's that awful rhyme. It keeps going round and round in my head. I think I'll remember it till I die. Mr. Bloor's a long time. I suspect the big, bad wolf's got him. I've asked you once before to try and restrain your rather peculiar sense of humor, Captain Lombard. Sorry, sir. It must be a form of nervousness. Put your hands up. Search him. No, thank you. Come now, you've had no dinner. You couldn't eat anything. I warn you, Laura will block. I don't see why you need to be so funny about all this. Starving ourselves won't do us any good. How are we off cigarettes? I haven't got any. I've run out too. Fortunately, I'm a pipe smoker. I've got a whole box upstairs. 
could do with the cigarette myself. Be sure you all stay where you are. Not bad, these biscuits. What are they, cheese? Cheese and celery. Girl ought to have some. Her nerves are in a bad state. I don't know that I'd agree with you there, Doctor. Miss Claythorne strikes me as a cool and resourceful young lady. Remarkably so. So that's your idea? She's the guilty party? Hardly likely. A woman? You and I, Doctor, seem to see women from slightly different angles. I say. What does anybody say to a spot of whiskey? Good idea, provided we tackle an unopened bottle. Sorry he was ever born. Who's that? Don't worry, Miss Claythorne. It's only me. Here we are. Who fired that shot? <laughs> He's dead. Shot through the head. One got in chancery. And then there were four. Miss Claythorne! Vera? You got me out of the way. You got me to go upstairs for cigarettes. You did it all so you could kill that helpless old man in the dark. You're mad. All of you crazy. That's why you wanted the scarlet oil silk curtain and Mrs. Brent's knitting wool. This has been planned long ago for this. Oh my God, get me out of here. <laughs> Thorn, I don't mind joking on a full stomach. I must say I was hungry, but all the same I shall never fancy tin tongue again. I was wanting that meal. I feel a new man. Well, we had been nearly 24 hours without food. It certainly does lower the morale. Somehow in the daylight everything feels different. You mustn't forget, there's still a hung Santa lunatic loose somewhere on the island. Why is it one doesn't feel jittery about it anymore? Because we know now, beyond any possible doubt, who it is, eh, Blore? That's right. It was the uncertainty before, watching each other, wondering which. I told you all along it was Dr. Armstrong. You did, my sweet, you did. Until, of course, you went completely bats and suspected us all. That seems rather silly in the light of day. Allow Very silly. Allowing it to be Armstrong, what happened to him? Well, we know what she wants us to think has happened to her. What exactly did you find? One shoe. 
Just one shoe sitting prettily on the cliff's edge. Inference, Dr. Armstrong has gone completely off our unit and committed suicide. All very circumstantial, leading to one broken China soldier in the doorway. I think that was rather overdoing it. No one would think to do that if they were going to drown themselves. Yes, but we're quite certain she didn't drown herself. She only wanted it to appear as if she was the seventh victim, all according to plan. Tell me exactly what happened in the night. Well, after you threw a fit of hysterics and locked yourself in your room, we decided we should all do the same thing, so we went to bed and locked ourselves in our room. About an hour later, I heard someone walk past my door. I tapped on Bloor's door. He was there, all right. Then I went to Armstrong's room, and it was empty. That's when I tapped on your door and told you to sit tight, no matter what happened. And then I came downstairs. The window was open, and my revolver was just lying beside it. I suppose she really is dead. I'm a bit suspicious of death without bodies. How extraordinary to think there are five dead bodies in there, and we've been sitting here eating tin tongue. The delightful feminine disregard of the facts. There are six dead bodies, and they're not all in there. Oh, no. She's right. There are only five. What about Mrs. Rogers? I've counted her, and she makes the fifth. Now look here. Marston, one. Mrs. Rogers, two. General Mackenzie, three. Rogers, four. Emily Brett, five. Wargrave, six. Seven, eight, nine. Armstrong, ten. Sorry, old man. Wouldn't it be an idea if we brought Mrs. Rogers down and put her in the morgue, too? I'm a detective, not an undertaker. For heaven's sake, quit talking about bodies. The point is, Armstrong killed them. We ought to have realized it was Armstrong straight away. How the devil do you think Armstrong got your revolver? I haven't the slightest idea. Where do you think she is? Lurking somewhere, waiting to have a crack at one of us. We ought to search the house. What, and walk into a trap? I hadn't thought of that. Sure, you heard no one searching about and walking about while we were searching the house last night. Oh, I heard all sorts of noises, but nothing short of setting the house on fire would have gotten me to leave my room. I see. It's all just thoroughly suspicious. What are we going to do? We must do something. If you ask me, we do nothing. We sit tight and take no risks. Look here. I want to go after that fellow. The dog of the bulldog breed you are, Bloor. By the way, between friends and without prejudice, you did go in for that little spot of perjury, didn't you? Well, I suppose it makes no odds now. The gang squared me. Between us, we put Lendor for a stretch. Mind you, I wouldn't admit it if it wasn't that. You think we're all in the same boat? Well, I couldn't admit it in front of Mr. Justice Wargrave, could I? No, hardly. I say, do you think Seton was innocent? Oh, I'm quite sure of it. Wargrave had a reason for wanting him dead. Well, Floor, I'm delighted you came off your virtuous perch. I hope you made a tidy bit of it. Nothing like what I should have done. They're a mean lot, that Benny gang. Got my promotion, though. And Lendor got penal servitude and died in jail. I couldn't tell he was going to die, could I? No, that was your bad luck. It is, you mean. Yours, too, because as a result of that fact, you might have your life cut short unpleasantly soon. By who? Armstrong? I'll watch it. You'll have to. Remember, there are only three little soldier boys here. What about you? I will be quite all right, thank you. I've been in tight places before, and I've gotten out of them. Besides, I've got my revolver. Yes, that revolver. That revolver. Now, what's to say you haven't had that on you the entire time? Same old gramophone record. No room in your head for more than one idea at a time, is there, Bloor? No, but it's a good one. And you're sticking to it? And I would have thought of a better story than that if I were you. I only wanted something simple a policeman could understand. And what's wrong with the police? Nothing, now that you've left the force. Lombard, if you're an honest man... Oh, come, Bloor, we're neither of us honest. If you're telling the truth for once, you ought to do the square thing and chuck that revolver down there. Don't be an ass. If I'm willing to search this entire house for Armstrong, you ought to do the square thing and give me that revolver. I won't. It's mine. It's my revolver, and I'm sticking to it. Then you know what I'm beginning to think? You're not beginning to think it, you square-headed flatty. You thought it last night, and now you're back to your own original idea. 
that I'm the one and only Mr. Unknown Owen. Is that it? I won't contradict you. Well, think what you darn well please, but I'll warn you. I think you are both behaving like a pair of children. Sorry, teacher. Of course Captain Lombard isn't the unknown. The unknown is Dr. Armstrong, and I'll give you one very good proof of it. Oh, what? Think of the rhyme. Four little soldier boys going out to sea. A red herring swallowed one, and then there were three. A red herring. Don't you see the subtlety of it? That's Armstrong's pretend suicide, but it's only a red herring. So she really isn't dead. That's very ingenious. To my mind, it is absolute proof. You see, it's all mad because she's mad. She takes a queer, childish, crazy pleasure in making it all stick to the rhyme. Dressing up the judge, killing Rogers while he was bent over the wood box, using a hypodermic needle on Mrs. Brent when she may as well have just killed, just drugged her. You see, she's got to make it all fit in. That ought to give us a pointer. Where are we at now? Three little soldier boys walking in the zoo, a big bear hugged one, and then there were two. He'll have a job with that one. There's no bear on the island. <laughs> I say, what does anybody say to a bottle of beer? Do stop thinking of your stomach, Floor. This craving of food and drink will be the death of you. But there's plenty of beer in the kitchen! Yes, and if I were going to kill you, the first place I'd think of putting a lethal dose would be in a nice bottle of beer. What's that? What's that? A boat? A boat! Floor's got his. How? Booby trap all set. Something attached to the door, attached to something up above. Is he? Yes, crushed. Head stove in. The bronze bear from the landing holding a clock. A bear? Oh, how ghastly is this awful childishness. I know. God, what a fool Bloor was. And then there were two. Yes, we better be quite careful of ourselves. Oh, we won't do it. He'll get us. We'll never get off this island. Yes, we will. I've never been beaten yet. Don't you feel that there's someone in this room watching us? Watching and waiting? It's just nerves. So you do feel it? No, I don't. Please, Philip, let's get out of this house. Anywhere. Okay. We'll go up to the top of the island. It's sheer rock from the cliff's edge, and we can hear if anyone approaches from the house. Anywhere's better than here. Won't you be a bit cold in that dress? I'll be colder if I'm dead. Perhaps you're right. A quick reconnaissance. Be careful, Philip. <laughs> I'm not glory. There's nothing directly above the window. Hello, that's strange. There's something washed up on the rocks. It looks like a body. You'd better wait here. Armstrong. Armstrong's body. It's Armstrong. Drowned, washed up on the high water mark. So there's no one on the island. No one at all except us. Yes, now we know where we are. Now we know where we are? So you did kill that kid after all? No, I didn't. That's where you're wrong. Please believe me. Please listen to me. I'm listening. You'd better make it a good story. It's not a story. It's the truth. I didn't kill him. It was someone else. Who? A man. Peter's uncle. I was in love with him. This is interesting. Don't sneer, it was hell, absolute hell. Peter was born after his father's death. If he were a girl, he would have had everything. The well-known tale of the wicked uncle? Yes, he was wicked, and I didn't know. He said he loved me, but he was too poor to marry. There was a rock far out that Peter was always wanting to swim to. Of course I wouldn't let him, it was too dangerous. One day we were at the beach and I'd forgotten something at the house. I went back to get it and when I came out, I saw Peter swimming out to the rock. He hadn't a chance. The current had gotten to him already. I flew down to the beach and Hugh tried to stop me. Don't be a fool, he said. I told the little ass he could do it. Go on, this is interesting. I pushed past him and he... I plunged into the sea, but Peter was already gone. And then everything went off well at the inquest. They called you the plucky girl, and you kept discreetly about Hugh's part in the business. Do you think anyone would have believed me? Besides, I really was in love with him. And then I suppose Hugh let you down. Do you think I ever wanted to see him again? 
Well, you certainly are an accomplished liar, Vera. Don't you know when someone's telling you the truth? Then who set the trap for Blore? I didn't, and Armstrong's dead. I've broken most of the commandments in my day, and I'm no saint. But there's one thing I won't stand for, and that's murder. You won't stand for murder? What about those natives you left to die in Africa? That's what's so funny. I didn't. What do you mean? For once, just once, mind you, I played the part of the hero. Risked my life to save the lives of my men. Left my, then my rifle and my ammunition and all the food there was. I took a chance through the bush. By the most incredible luck, it came off, but not in time to save the lives of my men. Then the word got around that I deliberately abandoned them. That's life for you. Do you honestly expect me to believe that? Why? You already admitted to the whole thing. I know, I just got such a kick out of watching their faces. You can't fool me like that. Blast you. Why didn't I see it before? It's there in your face. The face of a killer. You can't fool me any longer. You cunning little devil. Move one step closer and I will shoot. You. Young, lovely, and quite, quite mad. It's all come true. Ah! My ten little soldier boys plan. My rhyme, my rhyme. Silence in the court. If there is any more noise, I shall have the court clear. It's all right, my dear, it's all right. Don't be frightened. This is a court of justice. You'll get justice here. You thought I was a ghost. You thought I was dead. Armstrong said I was dead. That was the clever part of my plan. Said we'd trap the murderer. We'd fix up my supposed death so I'd be free to spy upon the guilty one. Armstrong thought it an excellent idea. She came out to meet me that night by the cliff without any suspicion. I sent her over with a push so easily. She swallowed my red herring all right. You know, Miss Claythorne, all my life I wanted to take life. Yes, to take life. I had to get what enjoyment I could out of sensing the guilty to death. I always enjoyed that, but it wasn't enough. I wanted more. I wanted to do it with my own hands. But I'm a judge of the high court. I've got a sense of justice. As between the sovereign lord our king and the prisoner at the bar, will true deliverance make. Guilty, my lord, yes. Guilty. You are all guilty, you know, but the law couldn't touch you. So I had to take the law into my own hands. Into my own hands! Silence in the court! Anthony Marston first, then Miss Rogers barbed under the brandy. Mackenzie stabbed, got Rogers with an axe when he was chopping sticks, doped Emily Brent's coffee so she couldn't feel hypodermic. Booby trap for Blower. Blower was a fool. I always knew it would be easy to get Blower. Returning the revolver was a clever touch. Made the end interesting. I knew you two would suspect each other in the end. Question was, who'd went out? I banked on you, my dear, the female of the species. Besides, it's always more exciting to have a girl at the end. Vera Elizabeth Claythorne, I sentence you to death. <gasps> They all say that, mostly not guilty. Unless, of course, you're going off with the verdict of insanity. But you're not mad, my dear. I'm mad, but you're not. You'll never get away with it. I shan't be around to find out. I shall be found laid neatly in my bed, shot through the forehead in accordance to the records kept by my fellow victims. I've thought it out to the last detail. Most ingenious. Using that revolver and taking great care to preserve your fingerprints on it, I shall loosely attach a cord from my spectacles to the trigger. It's elasticated, you see. I shall loop the cord around the doorknob. Then, with the weight of my body on the glasses, I will pull the trigger. The revolver will recoil, <laughs> jar the door, and detach itself. Needless to say, when the sea dies down, there will come from the mainland boats 
and men. They will find ten dead bodies and an unsolved mystery on Soldier Island. But first things first. No, please, no. You know, my dear, you were one of the last of my guests to be recruited for this. I happened to be crossing the Atlantic at the time, and the sole occupants of the smoking room were myself and a good-looking young gentleman. He had taken a considerable quantity of drink and was in a maudlin, a confidential state. He told me the most intriguing story. I can remember his words now. I've known a murderess, known her, I tell you, and what's more, I was crazy about her. You wouldn't think a girl like that, a nice, straight, jolly girl, would take a kid out to sea and let it drown. Naturally, I had to be absolutely certain. So I asked if he was sure she had done it. And suddenly sober, he thrust his face into mine. Quite sure, you see, she did it for me. I knew the moment I looked at her. No, please, I didn't kill that child. I never meant to kill him. During the gramophone recital, I watched the faces of you all closely. After my long court experience, I had no doubt whatever that you were guilty, my dear. And now you've killed Lombard, haven't you? How does it feel to be a killer? To be guilty? Ah, uh, you liked him, didn't you? <laughs> Prisoner at the bar, have you anything to say why sentence should not be passed on you? I can't spoil my lovely rhyme, my ten little soldier boys. You're the last one. One little soldier boy left all alone. He went and hanged himself. I must have my hanging my hanging, and you must pay for your crimes, for what you did to that poor, innocent young boy. For Lombard, yes. Ten. One little soldier boy left all alone. Goodbye, my dear. He went and hanged himself. And then there were. <laughs> now. I'm forgetting something. Ah, of course. How silly of me. We wouldn't want anyone thinking you killed yourself, now would we?
We love you, Josh. <laughs> One time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah